the author of the Holy Scripture, the Holy Spirit. By your action, Father, we pray. May you give us development. May you give us understanding of the scriptures to know and appreciate our Lord and God, Lord Jesus Christ, of the sacrifice which you made for us. Lord, we pray that when we are finished today, we will be able to understand why we became Christians in the first place. Thank you. May you direct us this so that we can do this. Your name, in the name alone, be glorified. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, mighty and wonderful name, we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Today, we are, we are going to make it a question and answer session. We are going to be looking at the questions that um, we need to know why we are Christians. So we have got reasons why there is need for evangelism. It's very important for us to understand evangelism. When one becomes a Christian, because we are being saved from the world, in, from darkness into his marvelous light, there's a commission that comes a, a burden that comes with being a new convert to want everybody to know that which you have known now because many today are living in ignorance. God said he's willing to ignore the days of ignorance according to Acts chapter 17 verse 13. Today, tonight, morning for others, evening for others, afternoon, we just want to discuss a few things about evangelism. Evangelism basically is a process of taking the scriptures, the great tidings, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those that have not known him, to those that have been misrepresented um, to by the Nimrodic clergy, the priestly caste, professional priestly caste, the ones that um, has produced the laity, that you don't need to do anything, it's the pastor that does everything for you. We will take some questions, I'm just laying a bit of foundation so that or we'll go through the scriptures of why it is necessary. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he left the earth, after the resurrection, he gave a commandment. And the importance of that commandment cannot be underestimated. Every believer in Christ Jesus is obliged to obey the Great Commission to preach in homes, on the street, in classrooms, at work, in hospitals, in jails, in parks, wherever people are. That is the essence of Christianity, the essence of gospel. If you are ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you as well before the holy angels. So I'll, I'll be asking every one of us to be reading a few Bible verses so that we can discuss. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Can somebody read that for me, please? Matthew chapter 16. I'll give everybody opportunity to read. Okay, if you're not there, I'll read in Jesus' Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew 16, verse 15. 15. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Yes. He, yes. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Yes, because when we are going out there, we are selling our gospel. Who do we tell people Jesus Christ is? Because it's important. We cannot go and just say, ah, come to Jesus. Who is he? 
What does he do? People ask you, is he, is he from Hollywood? What does he do? Does he play football? Say, no, 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 no. It's a lot bigger than all those things combined together. He is the one that created us. He is the one that paid the price for us. Sister Esther, can you read for me John chapter 3, verse 16? John chapter 3, verse 16. Are you available, Sister Esther? Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Yes, John, sir. 3, 6, John 3, 16. For God so yes. loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. When you read the next two verses, 17 and 18, if okay. you reject if you reject him, you are rejecting life. Okay, 17. Mm -hmm. for, God, for, for, God did, for God did not send his son into the world to, to condemn the world, to condemn the world, but that, but that the world brought him might be saved. 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because Amen. he has not he has not believed believe. in the name um, of the of the hmm. only in the name in the begotten. name only begotten son of God. Amen. Who is the Lord Jesus Christ? So hmm. Why do we need to evangelize? We need to tell people that we are born in sin, according to King David in Psalms 51. He say, in my mother's womb, I was conceived in iniquity. We all came out as sin. I will explain that very clearly. We all came out as sinners, but when we receive Christ, we are brought into the family again. We can approach the throne of grace justified to stand. As we get what they call imputed righteousness. That's what a baby gets. When we say a sinner, it is a sin when, I will explain a little bit later, when a small child, two, three, four, five years, if they steal sugar, they come up with white beards like this. They know if mama catches me, they're going to give me a patch. I don't know the English, I've forgotten the English word, like a small patch at the back. They wipe their mouth clean. It means they now know. What they are doing, mama had warned them from doing this, those things. So when that child does those things, they have come of age. So there's no particular age that is limited to sin. So children, as the earliest they can understand, they sin. As, as old as you are, 116 years, you still can sin. It goes either way, and in between is a lot worse because we are still sensitive, we are still in the world. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want somebody to read for me 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. I read in Jesus' name. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and teaching. And the verse five. Verse five. Yes, of the same way you read. Okay. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, 
do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Amen. So the Bible is very clear. Watch out. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelism. Make full proof of thy ministry. When you say ministry, I've, I've seen a great misunderstanding. I was discussing with brothers from Pastor Sambo Ministry. We have got unrepented and regenerated souls. Some are even general overseer. That is the tragedy of it all because the foundations have been destroyed. They heard God is going to use you. Before they sat down, discipled, and learned the gospel, they probably think reading the Bible, knowing the scriptures, does not make you a preacher. It is the anointing of God that brings that change into people's lives. You could have probably God called you into a ministry. Remember the choir stars, the hospitality, the people that receive people when you've got visitors in the church. These people are all, these are all ministries. When you say ministry, don't look at one address, one building where you got the people together and say, yes, that is evangelism. Or no, or I want to start a church. Starting a church on the basis of a prophecy or to say one angel came in, I will tell you one thing, if you were called by an angel, then you are called by a demon. Angels, they don't call anybody in the office. That is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who calls the people. The angels can later in between bring messages to you, but the one that calls you is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In case you'll be deceived to say, God said I will have a ministry. I saw an angel with wings. Oh yes, remember the devil comes as an angel of light. Evangelism. We said the Lord Jesus Christ commanded it. The apostles also commanded it. So through evangelism, many people will be encouraged because the gospel is the good news. You don't have to be rich. Now there's a preservation of the gospel. You need to have good shoes. You need to put on a jacket and a tie. You need to have an aeroplane. You need to have a car for you to evangelize. We've seen all sorts of excuses. Even here in our own ministry, if I were to ask how many people have distributed our magazines, after putting in so much resources, so much effort, people are even ashamed to, you know, when we talk about evangelism, it's not only going and teaching. The materials that can help somebody to change their life, you are keeping it to yourself. It does not grow any better. Not like wine that it grows better with egg. Send it out. It can change somebody's life. I've had people calling from England that have sent that magazine. Pastors, servants of God. They are encouraged. Yet the people who are sitting from where the magazine is being produced, they don't, they don't send it out. That's why I'm saying evangelism. Charity begins at home. If you are ashamed, we've got this kind of programs. People, nobody invites their brethren. Remember, when you're called to evangelism, we evangelize in our own homes. Some of our spouses we do not, we don't believe. Brothers who don't believe, I mean siblings, neighbors, aunts, aunties. We've got workmates who don't believe. God did not send you to that place where you work where you are going to school, by mistake. You are supposed to be an ambassador. Everywhere where you are, 24 seven, you are a Christian. There are no private moments in eternity. You cannot say, ah, today, I do not want to preach. Ah, today, people are going to say this. People from my office, they see this message. Oh yes, when I get back to work, I'll be telling them this is what I was talking about cohabitation, so are you, uh, they asked me, are you suggesting that I should leave my boyfriend say, that is your decision. What I do is I take you to the cross. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19, 
to make a choice for yourself. If you make a good choice, you're going to live. It's not for me to come and make a decision. I'm not going to micromanage somebody's life. Every one of us knows what is good. So we cannot use that one as an excuse. So through evangelism, many people are encouraged. That's why it's important, one, to send our magazine, to send our tracts, to send our devotions. People's lives are being changed. We are encouraging somebody. Like we always say, CHMI as a ministry has nothing to offer except the word of God. We don't have heaven to promise you. Heaven is only by, we only enter into heaven through Jesus Christ and it belongs to God. No man can tell you 100% I'm going to heaven. I wouldn't know until I enter. Many ministers of God have become so presumptuous. We need to walk right with him. Like he talked to Father Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, 1b, where he said, walk before me and be thou perfect. When you read Genesis 5, 24, Enoch, Enoch walked with God and he was no more. Exodus 19, 1 to 5, he's talking about the same thing, be a holy for his holy. So we need to encourage people to live a holy life. We need to encourage them. There is nothing in this world we used to say having fun in the world, drinking beer, chasing women, looking for money. That's what we called, ah, I was happy, I enjoyed my day today. Every day, that day you're saying you're enjoying, you're walking closer to a death. I cheated death a number of times. That the spirit of God was just holding me like this. Until the time came, then the Lord said, you can run, but you cannot hide. So I made a commitment to myself, say, God, you did not call me from the world to come and perish at your feet. It takes a lot of commitment, discipline, consistency to remain at the feet of our Lord and God. So evangelism is an opportunity to work directly for and with God. I don't know that my beloved sister Odele is here. Can you read for us Luke chapter 10, verse 2? Yes, big bro, I'm here. Okay, Luke 10. Luke two. chapter 10, verse 2. A moment. Yes, Luke chapter 10, verse 2. It says, Therefore yes. said he unto them. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send for the laborers into his harvest. Praise the Lord. Amen. That is the equivalent of Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 to 38. So it gives somebody an opportunity to work directly. When you look at the world right now, it's a virgin land. It's a land that needs to be tilled. Evangelism, evangelism. Yes, it precedes baptism and salvation. Minister Scott, can you read for me Mark chapter 16, verse 16, please? Mark 16, what was the verse? 16, 16, 16, 16. 16, 16. Mm -hmm. And I read, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Okay, thank you. So it precedes baptism and salvation. Before one is baptized, they need to know the word. Evangelist Lillian, can you read for me Mark chapter 10, I think? Let me quickly check. Uh, Romans, sorry, Romans chapter 10, verse, I think from 8. Romans, just go to Romans chapter 10. I'll check. I'll check. I don't want to mix up the faces. It is easy to get from, uh, start from 10. Romans chapter 10 from verse 10 to? 14. Okay. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. 
For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. 13. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in, in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen. Amen. So we see already, how, how can somebody believe in something, in somebody that you have not heard? You don't know there's a language that is called Mandarin, a language, the language from Vietnam. No, but none of us knows what name it is. How do you know if you don't meet somebody who's coming from Vietnam to come and tell you, ah, this is our language. So this is the same thing. When we want to bring people into the kingdom of God, we have got to tell them. But say, how will they tell them if they are not taught? That's why it's important. We don't just come in. There's a great misconception, especially in holiness ministries. The only thing they just come, you are going to help. You are going to help. What they have done is exactly what the Pharisees are. Outside looks 100%. Inside, dead bodies. So it's a person, gospel must be balanced. When we are going out there, it's more about the love of Christ. It's more about John chapter 3, verse 16. If they reject it, they go to 18. Not a person, we don't want to scare people into coming to the Lord. They must come out of obedience, out of love. We've seen a perversion of gospel. That's where this and regeneration is. People are still living in sin. People are still committing fornication. They are still in church. All of those sins that we know uh, that we know about, I don't know, two days ago or three days ago when I was doing one teaching, when the Bible says flee from all forms of fornication, these things are in the church today, talk more in holiness ministry. It's called the poneo, the Greek word for it. This is the parent term for all kinds of fornication, pornography, master. All those things, they come in there. So we need to tell people, there is a man who paid the price for all of them. And that price is, it was paid by something more special. That's the only blood that we get in heaven. That's the only blood. Through this blood, nothing can stand in combat. So this is the blood that we put, we put our hopes on. All our hopes are pinned on the blood of Jesus Christ. Dada Helen, John chapter 15, verse 12 to 14. John, Johann, 12, 15, 12 to 14. Sorry, John, what? John 15, 12 to 14. Okay. I read in Jesus' name. 15. Yeah, I read in Jesus' name. Okay. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Amen, if you do whatsoever I command you. God is saying, when I was teaching on laying the foundation, you cannot love God more than you love the word. There is no way that say, I love God more than the word. No, it's a lie. So he said, if you love me, 
follow my commandment. The Lord Jesus Christ is the word personified. The scriptures are the written word. So there is no contradiction between the two. You cannot love this one and hate the other. So if so, it proves our love for our Savior. Because he said, if you love him, keep my commandments. But today, no, we don't keep our commandments. Dada Chimi, Luke chapter 10, verse 9. Amen. Luke 10, 10 verse 9. Verse 9, 9, I read. And heal the sick. And heal the sick that are daring. And say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Amen. So, what is the Bible trying to say? It opens the door for healing to evangelism. Signs and wonders are going to follow. This is the teaching that we started this week, the fivefold ministries. We're just still on the introduction. We're going to see what are the duties of an evangelist, who is called to be an evangelist. So it opens up the door for evangelism. Um, I don't know if brother or pastor Kisitu can you help me read Luke 24, verse 47, please? Mjungaji Kisi. Okay, Sister Noella. Please, can you come again with the, the scriptures? Um, what scripture? Uh, Luke 24, verse 47. Luke 24, verse 47. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Amen. It is the gateway of repentance and remission of sins. Repentance is the benchmark of, it is, repent, it is repentance that leads us to holiness. Holiness is the bread that you see. That's the end product. There is a process. There are, all, there are many other things that happen in between, but we are too quick to read only at the end. Now, I mean, holiness, it's a process. It's not an overnight thing where everybody comes and says, now I'm in holiness, now I'm in holiness. That achieve me, Acts chapter 8, verse 30. Acts 8, 13. 30, 30, right? 30, okay. Acts 8, 30, I read. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So it brings other of scriptures unto humanity. Remember that way evangelist Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch. The one said, do you even understand what you are reading? He said, how will I understand if nobody explains the scriptures, which Apostle Paul was now explaining in Romans chapter 10 from verse 8. With your heart, you believe. With your mouth, you confess. Okay, brother Kisitu, can you read Acts chapter 10, verse 44, please? Uh, read what? Acts. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Acts. Correct, please proceed. Um, while Peter was still speaking these words, 
the Holy Spirit came down on all those who had the message. The circumcised mm -hmm. believers. Hello? Can I continue? Yeah, sure, sure, continue. Okay. I was just saying the again. circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been powered out on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Amen. Peter, no, it's okay now. So okay. evangelism causes the Holy Spirit to move. These were non-believers. So the moment you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can be baptized by the Holy Spirit. The water baptism comes if you are, if you understand, it's a open confession of your faith according to First Peter chapter three, verse twenty-one, where you are confessing your faith publicly. That's why we don't baptize children; we dedicate them unto the Lord. Proverbs chapter eleven, verse thirty. Sister Odell, are you there? Still here? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Proverbs 11, 10? 30, 30. Le 11, 30, okay. Proverbs 11, 30. It says, the fruit of the, of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls, souls is wise. Amen. So he that winneth souls is wise. That's what we are called to do. Don't go, don't go to the Lord or before the Lord without a soul to your name. One, the souls that you are given, the people in your own home, in your own home where you live. The people that you grow with, you grew up with, practically your brothers, your mother, your parents. Those people, you must lead them to Christ, especially repenting that their sins are forgiven. The, the fact that you are in holiness, let me explain why we need to evangelize. Many think that they are in holiness. They used a wrong date of birth when they were coming to Europe. They changed their name when they were coming to Europe. It does not go away. It will not go away. I want to make that very clear. You need to repent, you need to restitute. If you come with a different name, the names that you answered at birth are the names that are known in heaven. If you change from 15 to 14, your date of birth is no longer existent, you are a liar. Revelation 21 verse eight say all liars are not going to enter. The fact that you are in holiness does not make those sins go away. That's what the accuser of the brethren will be holding. You will be deceived. So that's why it is the duty of those that have come to light to bring to knowledge of those that are still living in sin. We have got pastors who are now saying, no, it's okay. Pastors, it's not in your state to take the seat of Christ. If a person lied, they need to restitute. You cannot lie that I died yesterday when you're dying today. It matters before. It looks simple. That God is now beginning to use you in church. Oh, yes. The Bible is very clear. Many are called, few are chosen. So it's not about calling. Nobody's going to dispute your calling. We have got many anointed servants of God in hell today. Remember Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Yes, you are evangelizing. But we don't want you to start on a faulty foundation. Proverbs chapter, sorry, Psalms chapter 11, verse 3. What can the righteous do if the foundations be destroyed? So that you are evangelizing, you have got the zeal. Zeal and maturity are two different things. I'll read you, the, I'll read you this part. It's one of the Bible verses that may, really scares me. Evangelist, read and read for me, please. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that 
they may be saved. For I hear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to the knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Amen. These are people in church. These were people in churches. Remember from Malachi to the book of Matthew, 465 years, the Lord was quiet. When you read in the Old, Old Testament, the Pharisees, the scribes, they were not there. They came in that 400 years where there was nobody. That's when the Lord came in and said, there were traditions of men. The one that was quarreling with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. Why is it that your, your guys do not wash their hands? No, it's not about the washing of hands because everything had changed. So evangelism unites all nations, races, tribes, cultures, reconciling humanity to God through Christ. So these people that you see now that you are talking about, that I pray in my heart's desire for these people, I profess that they have got zeal, but not according to knowledge. There is no holiness without obedience to the word. There is no obedience to the word without repentance. Forget about it. If you will like to go to the scriptures, it's not your pastor who tells you that you are born again. There is a standard. There is a standard in the Bible. If you went to school as, as a teacher, as a psychologist, as an engineer, there are basic things that you are, you are supposed to know according to your profession. If you are called of the Lord, those things must be apparent. This is the basic knowledge, very basic, the foundational knowledge of a Christian. Repentance for the remission of our sins. Because for you to acknowledge, to come to Christ, you must believe that you are a sinner. If you are not a sinner, you're righteous, then you don't need, you have no need for Christ. So the point is to take somebody to their sins. When they acknowledge their sins before God, say, now I'm a sinner, say, good. Go there to this man, he can save you. So before I open up to the questions, there's one, um, some of the questions that we asked last week. Well, three days ago, sorry. Three days ago, I think I was doing one teaching about the, I'm not sure whether it's what the invitation of the gifts or, or the, five, the fivefold. With the Bible is very clear especially on the issue of dressing. How should a Christian woman dress? It's one of the most heated debates amongst Christians. We have got liberal Christians now. Liberal Christians, they cannot come and condemn homosexuality. They cannot come and... Yes, when a woman is putting any, showing her legs or this, it is sexual immorality. That's what it is. No apologies, we hold no punches when you talk about these things. Why it's important, we'll explain. People should stop using that misapplied scripture. Matthew chapter seven, verse one. When you read a few verses down the line, it said by their fruit, you know them. So you cannot come, you cannot come and I cannot be offending an orange if I say it's an apple. There's no offense there. You are just telling it the way that it is. That's how it is. So it's a very heated topic. Pastors are coming. Women just put on those uh, weaves that are coming from the marine world. Sacrifice to those gods and demonic spirits. You look good from outside, but you look very ugly in the spiritual realm. Everything is worms because it's dedicated to the devil. They're dedicated to the devil. So what is modest? How do we define modest? It becomes sub subjective. It becomes relative. Depending on who is talking, who is talking. I was telling some brethren some time, some time ago, don't come and say it must be five centimeters below the knee. 
There, is, there are no centimeters concerning dressing in the Bible. Don't go into areas that conflict you. Don't use centimeters. As to say, it must be long enough that when you sit, it still covers your legs. That's it. It's a fair explanation. It's a reasonable explanation. The moment you come with centimeters, when we look at the Bible, when we don't find them, it makes you a liar. The Bible says, do not add or subtract to what is already written in the Bible. So you'll be starting on a faulty foundation. That's why brethren need to be taught before they go out there and start cursing people, cursing, yelling insults. Zeal and maturity are two different things. And maturity in Christianity, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts for maturity in Christianity. Whether you, you were a president, if President Trump were to be baptized now, you will become a baby Christian. You will have to go through. The wisdom that he, the wisdom that God gave him in the world, probably God gave him a word of a word of knowledge. So he could be more, 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 much more intelligent than an average pastor. But in terms of spiritual things, it may take a bit of while before he comes closer to the people that have been there for a while. So what did the Bible say about appropriate dressing? What is acceptable and what's not? Modest dressing isn't just when you go to church. We see brethren, sisters, I've seen pastors now. They've come in, you know, the liberal type of a gospel. They now come in and say, you know what? Uh, you can put on your trousers, it's okay. There's nothing wrong in putting on your trousers, nothing wrong. That what they don't tell you is uh, your opinion, your opinion. We have seen this spirit, especially when you see a woman putting the walk and say, oh, oh, it's the man. Yesterday, I was embarrassed. They, I was sent a clip from Ghana, from Uganda, sorry. The, the, it was a woman who was put dressing on as a man. There was one pastor. The pastor was very angry, very angry. And you could see this girl, these are the people she is a woman now, now she says she's a man and she's going to look for another woman. Now she's a man. So the man, the pastor was asking, do you have a family? Say, my family, don't judge me because they're getting money from, from, from those useless organizations in Europe that gives them millions of dollars. If you want to get rich now, you know, just to say, I'm a homosexual. Oh, you will get money. You will get money. That's what they are now doing. So it's not the kind of dressing that you put on coming to the church. I'd, I'd, um, um, just, uh, I, I don't know what the same German now. I had sorry, deflected, deflected. I'm not sure about the English word. Mm -hmm. I had uh, deflected from the topic, not distracted. I'm not sure I'll look for the English word as I'm going on. So the problem is the pastors are now coming in, they're choosing to be politically correct. There's nothing wrong putting on those trousers. Mm. The same trousers that you are asking them mm. has to put on. The same trousers that you are putting on, it's a pity. Do we have somebody sleeping? <laughs> Praise the Lord. We are still opening up. Is there anybody sleeping? Praise the Lord. Church of God. I, I'll, I'll ask us to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, modest <laughs> is well. Modest dressing is not only when somebody's going to church, it's how one dresses every day. Christianity is 24 7, like I said in the beginning. It's not those private moments where you put on those seductive dresses. There are spirits for everything that you do. You drink beer, there are spirits for it. You smoke, there are spirits for it. You do those masturbation, fornication, that's a poneo. There are spirits that comes after every other thing that you do. Every sin that demons are assigned to it. And when you start doing it, you become a liar. So another spirit of lying comes in. When you do that, another spirit of 
bitterness, everything just comes, low esteem, all these things come in. So you need to validate yourself through useless activities. So the worldly women may have taught you that wherever you, whenever you leave the house, you have got to prepare for a fashion shop. So you need to come in. I've heard pastors say, oh, women, just buy that bag. For bag for me, I don't think bag would start anybody. A bag, the greatest issue is about dressing. The way that women, anatomy-wise, they, um, they were made is different from men. I will tell you, you see a professor, war professor, coming from the university, teaching those engineering mathematics. They will see one foolish lady coming from the village. They will come, this is mathematics for dresses. They, they, what they know is mathematics for dresses. They will just come in and put on that. You will hear a professor saying, oh, how much? That's how evil that thing can be. Because the moment you see that brain is turned, you no longer think straight. Intellect, spirituality, and sexuality are three different dimensions. Three different dimensions. You will hear people asking, what did this man, what was this man looking for? What was this man looking for? So it's very important to understand when we go out there, there's nothing wrong taking care of our looks. Nothing wrong at all taking care of our Okay, praise the Lord. So there is nothing wrong taking care of how you look. You need to be presentable. I don't say don't come, don't come looking like an old woman or inviting lust from men instead. No, we said there must be that balance. We must strike the balance. Looking good, looking good doesn't have to mean showing off skin that a Christian woman shouldn't. You are now showing sensitive parts of your body to men. Oh, you are looking sexy. You see, ah, thank you. It's an insult. It's an insult for a Christian woman. I'm going to explain through a few Bible verses and see where the danger is. Don't come and just tell them, no, you are going to hell. No, we want to build up a case. Why is it wrong for a woman to put on that miniskirt, put on that trousers? We need to know. We need to have a scriptural basis. Like I said, Isaiah chapter 28 before, Isaiah 28 verse 10 says, precept upon precept. And there is a law of interpretation in the Bible. Don't come and hold one scripture. You are going to hell. That's what God said. Don't scare people to hell. Hell is there. We preach about it. 100%. But that's not what you are going to tell uh, somebody who doesn't know, who doesn't know God. I would rather have somebody come in love than out of fear. Like I said, looking good doesn't have to be showing parts of your body that are not supposed to be shown. The fashion world now shows the more skin you show the sexier you are. That's why women come on with the V-neck, almost the old parts will come out just like that. Christian women, you should know better. Or if you claim to be a Christian, you should know better. So there are a number of Bible verses that speak directly to Christian women and how they should dress. That's what we want to see modesty. So I'm going to be asking each and every one of us to be reading. Dada Chimi, you will take the honor for the first one. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. First Timothy 2, two nine, 9 to 10. To I read 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefaced mess and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold 
or pearls or costly array. But which becometh woman professing godliness with good works. Amen. Amen. Apostle Paul here was very clear when he was writing to the church. Because he said, in like manner, so I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and then he says, sorry, from nine, sorry. Yeah. In in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. This term modest is a, has become subjective, relative, just like truth, depending who is telling it. If you look, listen to CNN, that's what they call truth. A bunch of lies, they'll call them the truth. You go to this one, is saying the truth. Because we are supporting so and so, it becomes subjective, not the relative, depending on who is saying what. So Apostle Paul here said, I want women to dress modestly with the decency and the propriety, not with the braided hair, gold, or pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So if you are a professor of a woman professor, not that one from, from the university, once you profess something, you become a professor. <laughs> it must be something that you believe in. He's saying braided hair, the one that you say silly hair, go back, the one that reaches your waist. When men see, say, oh, mm, this woman, I don't think she, she, goes, she, she, she goes to shower. There are some women when you see, you think, oh, this one goes to dry cleaner. They don't even take the shower. Why? Because of all those things, artificial things they're putting. The nails are coming like this. The nails are bigger than that of Dracula now. That from that water field. Like they are going to eat somebody. What do you need those things for? That's what they are calling fashion in the church. And we call it witchcraft. Charismatic. We are not coming to church. To, to motivate people or to, there's a term that I, I usually use to, um, I think motivate. If you're looking for motivation, then you read Mahatma Gandhi or the books by Nelson Mandela. Those are the books that you can get motivation. But if you want to be encouraged in the Lord, you read the Bible. Such kind of things, they knew. Now there's competition. There are some women in the church they cannot go to the church wearing the same cloth. If God blessed you, it's okay. But we can do, we can do also. In, in Christianity, there are about five things, I think. Shelter, food, uh, shelter, food, clothes, honor, and glory. If you leave the first three, then you are most likely going to make it to heaven. If you are working at times, you spoil yourself here and there, it's okay. But no exaggeration. Don't push it over the top. When I say, what is expensive? Depending on the economy that you are living, there are certain jobs. I don't want you to look like you are, you are the gardener in a, getting into an office, you are looking like a gardener. Or you are looking like you, they gave you some snacks, immediately they paid you, they ran into some hole. We need to balance the two. Here he's saying, I want women to dress modestly with a decency. He went decently. We need to be decent. You cannot come with half chest like this coming up. When you are talking to you, when you are talking to one brother, ah, pastor say, ah, hmm. I say first, first Timothy, uh, first Timothy chapter two. No, 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 sorry, sorry. Hmm. Second Titus, ah, pastor, what is wrong? You know the Bible. Now you don't scatter the head. Yeah, pastor say, no, no, I want the third book, so the third book of Kings. He doesn't know pastor has forgotten that there are only two books of Kings. This is how bad it can become. Sin must come, but who through whom it comes. So in the Bible, it is clear that women must dress decently and modestly. Women must not take pride in wearing jewelry, but instead, take pride with good deeds they have done. This goes without saying that God wants women to clothe themselves with good works, not expensive clothes. Many, they come in, 
oh, they'll be smelling those uh, perfumes from, from the sirens. You know, when, <laughs> when the siren puts, a, puts those perfumes, the whole street will be following like this. Is, ah, Kai, did you see this woman? Yes, it's meant for that purpose, for the seductive purpose. That's why when they see, they just pass like this, 15, 20 minutes, mm, mm, you will be smelling, you say, oh, oh, that's it. There are men also who goes over the top. If you are to take it, he's shouting like this, a perfume that shouts that everybody knows, just getting 200 meters away, when the wind just blows a little bit, say, oh, that's him. And they'll be saying, I just put in a small dot that perfume. That's not how we're supposed to be. For Christians, you should dress modestly. The beauty is inside is what matters. Beauty inside is what matters. It is very important. Sister Noella. Sister Noella. First Peter yes, yes, chapter sir. three. First Peter chapter three. I hope you are. I hope you are feeling fit. Yes, yes, I am. You can run. First Peter chapter. Yes, First Peter chapter three verse. Okay. Two to five. Praise the Lord. Amen. First Peter chapter three verse two to five. I read in Jesus' name. When they observe your chaste, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment. Um, where, where are you reading this? From two. First, first Peter ah, okay. chapter three. You said first Peter yeah, chapter from three. Verse, yeah, from verse two. Oh yes, it's okay. Okay. I, I start from it. verse two or verse one. Yes, sure. No, from verse two. Okay. Verse 2 says, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Verse 3 says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Amen. Like Amen. The Bible is very, yeah, up to five. Okay, verse five says, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Amen. Amen. I want to, I, I want to encourage you, the other Bible versions have got a tendency to kill the letter. If anybody can get the King James Version Bible is the closest to the translated Hebrew and Greek. That's the very closest. 98 to 99%, that's the closest. In the English speaking, because every other language came out from there, outside the Greek power. The Greek was the colonial, the imperial power then. And the Jews themselves, because it was written by the Jews. So if you read, let, let me read it for you from here so that we see the difference here. It says, while they, be, while they behold your chest conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating hair, of wearing gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of the great Christ. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, adorned themselves being in subjection unto their husbands. So it's not, and when you say subjection, this word submission in every area of your life, so say no, I'm not going, I'm not going to submit this one. You cannot cherry pick scriptures. Oh yes. When you read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 120 and the scripture is not private, is not um subject to private interpretation. Your opinion is not needed. That's how God made it. 
stop coming in and say, ah, so it is unfair. God is not a Democrat. If you want a Democrat, go to America, where there are Democrats and Republicans. In the kingdom of God, we use this word, and what he said is what is to be followed. We don't have a God that can be present. If you want to be a true Christian, then you've got to obey the word of God to the letter. He said in John chapter 15, the one that we read, 8 and 14, if you read from my commandment, so this is unfair. This is unfair. You cannot come in and say, ah, my husband, he misbehaved with this. No. Submission must be in 100%. Either you submit or you don't. If you don't submit, this pair of verses is going to stand against you. So you are wasting your time. Either you are all in or you are all out. Therefore, you keep 60, 70%, nobody gets. So don't be deceived by those. Um, we, we, we have got advocates. Advocate women who came in, they said, ah, now we can also preach the Bible. They came in, that spirit, that spirit of rebellion, which the Lord said is like just for which Samuel 15, 23, where people are just coming, me, I can preach as well. Me, I'm going to open a church. Did God ask you to open a church? Say no. Because everybody wants power. But if God did not ask you to do those things, now it's in rebellion. Most pastors have suffered because there are women that are running the show. Pastor, I am the first lady in this church. This weave, young ladies, I want you to dress so that this young man can find you attractive. You cannot preach holiness again. When you put on a bit of miniskirt, they've got to see at least what you are getting. That's what the first lady is telling them. Obviously, they feel justified. They think the first lady is closer to God. God is not a respecter of men. It's not your pastor that comes in and validates the scripture. Forget about what they think. We all have good opinions. They are not needed in the Bible. They are not needed. So this is the beauty that comes from inside, from inside coming outside. Not only change outside, you are still that rebellious person that you are. You're still fighting with everything. It makes little sense because there must be regeneration. You must have truly accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. There must be brokenness in a Christian. That's the way it is. King Ahab is capitulated to his wife. I was telling a brother last week, he thought um, Jezebel died the, 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 the next day. I said, no, after about seven years, Jezebel died. She did not die that same day. I said, ah, they were eaten by the disease. Just like King, King David, when he was ordained, or when Saul, when, when the kingdom of Saul was taken, is it first Samuel 1530? When it was taken, he said the kingdom is taken. He reigned another 20 years from that time. So you can just imagine. So don't be deceived. You can come in and think the spirit of God is still with me. The gifts of God are without repentance. So don't be deceived. I'm going to explain a few things. I'm just explaining so that I'm trying to answer some of the questions. There are some of the questions because these are the questions that especially women always come up with. So dressing, so, 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 so is the Bible. So the Bible is saying this, the Bible is saying that. Yes, that's what says the Bible. If you claim to be a Christian, then you've got to obey it. There are no two ways. There are no, there's no middle of the, you know. I see there's a spirit of compromise in the church today. People come in and say, yeah, I do not want to offend somebody. Oh, if you're offended, the door is open. I preach this message where I live in our church here. Say, oh, pastor, this is this, this dressing, hey, the door is open. So you're asking me to leave. Oh, yes, you can leave. And I will not shed a tear. If it means telling you the truth will make you an enemy to God be the glory. 
I count it as a blessing. It's rather you minister to two, three people who know where they want to go than to be having thousands of people. They don't even say repentance. What is repentance? I don't even know. You took somebody's husband and say yes. What does it mean that we love? Uh -uh. Look how, look, just look justification. These are the people that the devil left the business cut with. Even because they're looking for younger women. And they see what I'm called. Yes, you're called, but not by God. The devil is your father. Once these hallmarks of sin are in your life, th this is what John was saying, whoever sins is of the devil. It was saying sin is a lifestyle. It doesn't mean we don't fall. We fall here and there. As Christians, we fall. We sin here and there, but not as a lifestyle. Not something that you do from morning until night. The next day, all your days, you are doing the same thing. It's not falling. It's sinning as a way of life. So submission is part of it. We're talking about dressing. This is why Apostle Peter wrote, your beauty should not come from the outward. That hair that you put on. Yes, you look good. Fine clothes. You see, their brand, their, 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 their brand names. It's okay. We're not going to take anything away from you. But he said it should be that your inner self, that unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So quite similar to that scripture above, the verse from where Apostle Peter talks to the inner beauty is more important than the outer beauty. God, you know, this is, this is where the people comes in. People say, ah, God looks at the heart. No, it's not only at the heart. Because when you are buying fruits yourself, when you are buying tomatoes, who has bought a foul tomato here? I don't know what I'm mean, using the correct English word. I know it's in German. The one that is almost rotting at the, at the outside. Who can buy a tomato that is rotten now to say, no, I want to go and go? No. But when it comes to God, you say, God, you manage this one. But when it comes to you, rotten inside, rotten outside, you say, no, God manage inside. Outside, you are seeing outside because it's the outside that is portraying what is inside. So it's not at times the good deeds that makes you beautiful. That gentle, quiet spirit and the pure heart that makes you shine. So as women, as mothers, there is no ministry that can stand without the mothers. The mother is always the foundation. When the women stand, things move. So they need carry the fire to tell the other young ones coming out there. Women should dress accordingly. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. This, I was just meditating on the question Sister Noella asked. What about those young children that are putting on trousers, are putting on this thing? As I was just meditating, it says, the woman shall not wear that which pertained unto a man, Neither shall a man put on, on a woman's garment, for all that do so is an abomination. That word does not call a girl is not a woman. But I don't want it to qualify. I don't want it to be taken out of context. I will have to expound and explain upon it. Because we have got cats, people with a, um, I don't want to say, a delinquent, a, a mischief, people with mischief. Who come and say, ah, pastor said, no, no, our daughters can, can put on trousers. No, I want you to get the whole picture. The same Bible said, train up a child in a way that they should grow up. So that when they grow up, they will not depart from them. So it's rather you start dressing them with skirts and dresses. The moment they become comfortable, they will never come back again. And which is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. So you choose. If it is a baby, I don't know how God judges. But I tell you, according to the Bible, a baby is not a woman. It may mean something else. It may mean something else. But when I just got my attention, it was brought to my attention. Oh, okay. Because I was just thinking, what is the difference? It says, a woman shall not put on. There is a difference between a woman and a girl. At times, the Bible says a woman standing for wife. So we need to be careful.
But I'm, I'm not saying once you become a woman, when you become 18, you become a woman. Because you are ready to be married or you can make an independent decision to whom you can date. You want to date an eight year old man, that's all up to you. So the fashion industry broke down the walls between male and female. I argued with one pastor. They said, pastor, there is a dress for woman. No? There is a dress for woman. They put the button to the left. They put the dress in. Get about that nonsense that you are talking about. The one that James Bond brought in. Now when they put Haley Berry, they say, oh, she's 55. She's looking like a sweet 16. Hmm. Don't follow those people. Those are demon incarnates. They put on a bikini. People are rushing and crying. They are putting on a bikini. So what? If you put that bikini walk on the street, they will arrest you. Sexual harassment. But if Beyonce walks in our street like this, people will be clapping hands like this. That's when you see the devil is a crack. So the fashion industry is broken these barriers. It's like everybody can wear anything. The society allows it. That is what has brought in this homosexuality now. Now they have brought in, they have broken it down. Now there's no toilet for boys or girls. You can just go in. Just imagine the level of stupidity, level of buffoonery. God has become so angry that he has removed common sense from them. Nabal could have done better, even though, even though the Bible called him fool. Nabal knew better. At least said an intelligent woman. So you, that is informed. You cannot come and tell something. What type of society are we living? Your niece comes dressing like this. Is oh cool. Half a chest is like this. Every man looks at this today. I'm going to read you the Bible verses so that you see. Don't tell them about it. Just tell them how many men they are sleeping with. That you and the prostitute out there, you are not. You are not different. When you, cross this, when you cross over to the other side, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it matters. It does really matter. So we don't follow what society dictates, not in Christianity. We do not. What's made for women should be made only for women. But now, this, this, where this perversion has come in, it has come through Beijing. Women's rights are, are human rights. No, it's not like that. Oh, come in. You come. That the one who's cooking, I cooked yesterday. I am not a Democrat. I'm sorry. If I'm to cook, I'll cook. But I must not cook taking turns. Today you are cooking. Today you are doing this, you know. If I'm to cook, I'm cooking out of love, not out of duty. Say yesterday I'm the one who cooked. Today you are the one. No. If you're a Christian like that, then I'm sorry. You're taking your Christianity. If you're a man, if you are doing it out of obligation, out of fear, then you need to revise. You have surrendered the headship of home. If you are a good cook, hey, but you don't be staying here. What's the next thing we'll see you put on that dress now? Things that you should do, you can come in working together, no problem. But don't let it become your duty. Said, so, ah, equal in the name of equal right, in the name of civility. There is no civility. The Bible, God is all fashioned. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why we call it the old ragged cross. There are no two ways. If you choose to, if you choose to be modern, then you are, you are carrying the cross of the devil. There's no modernity in Christianity. No modernity. The old ragged cross the Lord Jesus Christ carried is the one that we should all carry. There's nothing modern about God. You think, you think this mobile phone excites God? How do, how do you think he talks from heaven without getting an internet? You say, my child, rise. How do you think he talks? You think God sees a car, the one whose feet are sitting on the earth like this? Your television. You have got a television. Now you are driving a car. Says, ah, now I'm like God. Nonsense. A Christian woman must always practice good judgment when dressing. Your motive for dressing, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22, like a gold ring in a pig snout, is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Hmm. The Bible, when you see that man, Solomon, 
He said, I want Jesus. That's what he said. That wisdom is another name for the Lord. When you read it in Job chapter 28, he said, he said, I only heard it from my ears, so I don't know. Solomon said, give, please give me the Lord Jesus. He came. Gold was as common as dust. People just walk in and say, say gold, no, like one cent, you see one cent now. Say, I don't need it. That's how King Solomon made, because he had what matters most, the Lord Jesus Christ. So a truly beautiful woman must practice discernment because these shorts can make good faces. Putting on a dress that you'll be, ah, you're just trying to pull it down, trying to pull it down. Ah, you're looking good. That's it, Pastor. Last thing already. Remember, spirituality and sexuality are two different things. You go into that office with that pastor, you will hear the most, ah, pastor wanted to touch me. In those days when you grew up, they say, what were you putting on? You were, the, the victim was always the aggressor. Can you tell us why we were dressing on like this? The judge will say, ah, if me, I could have raped you. So you see the kind of things, but you are inviting that who at yourself. They are violated once. Wherever you go, it's written on your spirits follow you. They've so been violated already. They're everybody's woman. The verse that says, if a woman does death discernment, then she will make poor choices, just like a pig would. There's nothing good in a pig. Pig is just, you put it in a, in a good place. It says, no, me, I want to die. Where you are taking me from? Because where there is dirty, that's where it lies. When you see men following you like fly, just like when a child is crying, stop looking at the, um, say, uh, maybe the child is sick. Look at the compass. You see the flies coming in. Say, yes. That is what, that is, you have soiled yourself. Men are just looking, say, ah, this sister is looking good. If you see men still making those faces, those words around you, it's an insult. Consider this an insult. They say, thank you. There's nothing to thank him for. The next thing is, ah, would you like to drink some coffee? Say, ah, please. One thing leads to the other. We are talking about Christian women who are living in sin. Dating. Christian woman. I don't know how it happened, though. I don't know how it happened. You ended up at this house, you say yes. From McDonald's, I'll be say yes. After how long? Nah, the second week, he said, ah, let me just go and show you something. You sheepishly follow because the last, last of the flesh. You said, I'm only human. Somebody was trying to argue me. Say, Pastor, I'm, 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 I'm only flesh. I'm only human. Say, am I a spirit? Am I a spirit myself? Self-control. So I cannot come and be justifying. You said, yeah, I had to sleep with him because they said, now I've got to change my my new phone, I have got to change my email, I have got to... Sadly, it's a married woman. A married woman. One got pregnant while the husband was away. They cannot explain the pregnancy. The husband came now, we are three, we are three months pregnant, and said, how will I account for that? Now we don't know how to do. They just come in. Some of them are dying with this secret with them, piggish behavior. You lasted, you brought this war upon yourself through lascivious dressing. So you need to dress appropriately. A truly beautiful woman fears the Lord, and that is what makes a Christian more attractive. Dress yourself with strength and dignity. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity and laugh at the days to come. When a man sees it, oh, you don't come say, yeah? sure, you sister. No, no, when a man comes, they will come with the dignity. See, this one is a godly woman. There's a spirit that goes before you, the presence of God. When you're dressing like this, you say, huh? he looks like a huh? fine, fine girl. Hmm? And your smile, your smiling is reaching the ear because you think it's a compliment. When men want to take you to bed, they will tell you anything that you want to hear. 
I will worship on me. I will worship the ground that you are walking on. Huh? I will put on the red carpet. Smile is reaching the ears. Oh, speak, speak, man. Huh? Where was this man? Huh? You talk about poet. Just roll it like this. Scatter woman's brain. Said, ah, just wait. Give me a chance in DBC. Do you see? Say true. Say yes. I'll give you my number. Okay, number. Every day we'll be laughing. You know, one text this to the other, to the next, to the next. Before you know, it, ah, this man, he gets you into the first impression, you know, like in marketing. You don't need a second chance to make a first impression. He hits the point home. Woman is taken off. Say, so I'm a spirit, spiritual woman. Forget about that nonsense. Run. That's why we pray every day before we go out. Lead me not unto temptation. It takes somebody who wants to go to heaven to have self-control. It doesn't mean those things, we don't see them. We see Job had confident with his own eyes. So the scripture from Proverbs proves that a woman needs not to dress a sexy way for a man to like him. If a woman is clothed with strength and dignity, she is confident enough to say that I am God's wonderful and that is very important. The Bible, the one that we read, Timothy said likewise, you should adorn yourself in a respectable apparel, modest self-control. Self-control is what is lacking today. Now I'm going to answer the questions that was asked before. The one that um, people usually come and say, if you are dressing like this, you are going to help. We are going to help. The issue is not only about it's not only about help. We come, we are scaring people, we become scaremongers. People are just climbing like this, they're like they will touch each other's eyes like this, wanting to run, say, let me just go there. Maybe God will have God will have mess upon me. No. It's not your rushing to come into CHMA. CHMA is not going to, is not going to save you. Nobody. It's only the word of God. The Bible said, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have heard from God. You are not on your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your body. The same Bible verse was repeated again in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. When it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, I always say by the living God, because I want that living to be there. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He cannot come with a half a chest like this and say it's good and perfect unless your common sense is withdrawn from you. Unless common sense has been withdrawn from you, then he said, ah, okay, your, your conscience has been sad. You and the donkey, you are just the same. You no longer know the difference. So to this Bible verse now, why, why we say flee from all form of fornication, that word, the Greek word, poneo. Poneo, that I said, this is the parent term for all those, you know, sexual things. It comes under the parent. That's their surname. So the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, where the Lord was talking to them, they said, if you not hate, we shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that everyone who looks at a woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery with his, with her in his own heart. Apostle John Molinda from Uganda, when he, when he had an encounter with the Lord, he said he was read this First Corinthians chapter nine, uh, chapter First Corinthians chapter six, verse nine. All fornicators said, "Oh no," he rejected. The Lord stopped. He said, there is no crooked word that comes out of my mouth. Do you call me a liar? He was praying with his head down, eyes closed. He was, those eyes were opened when he was looking down. He was took, taken to a place in real time. He's sitting there, he said, watching a woman, dressing that woman naked with his eyes. So that's where that, that Bible verse, it hit hard. And he said, no. He said, oh, Lord, I have seen said, no. Hmm. That's how you live, going to bed, but even in church, even in my presence, even in my presence. 
even in my presence. How many pastors are going through these sins? These are sins it is easy for so, oh, our pastor is going to have you know. This is sins of sexual nature, masturbation, lustful, lascivious. These things, we don't see them with your own eyes. They go more into the heart. That's why Jeremiah chapter 17, 9 and 10 said, who can understand the heart? The 10 said, I, the Lord, searches the heart and take the reins. I will judge every man according to that which he has done, whether good or bad. So you have already committed adultery. So this is where it comes in now. Now we are talking to a sister. You are dressing like this. All your legs are out. Okay, you have got beautiful legs. We are told, yes, you look good. God gave you a good body, but not to seduce men. So now it's sexual immorality. How does immorality come in? You have already slept with a man. You have already slept with a man. So when you read this, first Timothy chapter six from nine, first Timothy six from verse nine, it says here, I'll quickly read. Oh, first Timothy chapter six, I think from verse nine, let me quickly check. Okay. I'm not see, I'm not saying well, but I think it should be there. Okay, I'll just tell you because I know it often anyway. It says all fornicators, all those sexual sins that are being mentioned, you will have not part in the kingdom of God. So it's very important for you to understand. When a person is dressed like that. Coming to dress like that, you are done. It's finished. Sorry, it's here. I think it's here. It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and stay into foolish age for lust, which are drawn to. No, I'm not sure where it is. Uh, but I think it's first the Timothy chapter. I think, I don't know what I was reading. I will check it for you. I will give it to you soon. So basically, when a person is dressed like this, you have caused a man to fall. Why is there any danger that you have caused a man to fall? You have caused somebody to fall. Why is there any danger that you have caused your brother to fall? This is where the Bible comes in handy. Yeah, first Corinthians, sorry, I was reading the first Corinthians chapter six, verse nine, sorry. Hmm. I don't know where I was reading. The one that says, no, you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You not be deceived, neither fornicators, adulterers, all those people, their family of drunkards to 14. The fornicators that are being mentioned here. It's all part, this is only a daughter of this um, Corneo. This is their family name. Fornicator, it leads to this adultery. Everything, it goes to the same thing. So you are telling a sister, because if a man looks at you lustfully, you have already slept with you, so you are fornicating it. If you are married, you are an outer, you are already there. Then God is going to listen to reject you. God is going to listen to reject you. The Bible then tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must be that offenses come, but, but woe through whom it so we are now telling a brother, a sister, we are addressing like this, and yes, you have given them this Bible verses. Now they know, you are beginning to open up their eyes. You are going on a journey with them. Now sin must come because this man was looking lustfully at you. The next thing is bumped by a car, he dies, he's going straight to hell. No two ways about it, he's going straight to hell. So when you read again, Ezekiel chapter three, verse 18, that sin, that blood will be required from you because he has slept with you. It's you who have caused him to, to fall, to stumble, probably was a, sin, a servant of God. So you can come and defend for all, for, all, for all we care, for all intents and purposes. The same Bible said, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, homongers, idolaters, liars shall have their part in the lake with Bennett, with fire and brimstone. So we can see here, when you're working with somebody, you are a liar. 
Because why? I did not sleep with a man, or I did not sleep physically with him. That's what the Bible says. And if you want to learn something in the book of Romans, the book of Romans, verse 920, he says, Who art thou that replies against God? Or the thing that is formed say to you, why is that made me like this? When you take this type of verses, you're giving this to somebody. A sister will look at you and say, now I understand. Don't go and just say, you are going to hell, you are going to hell. Make them know why they are going to hell. This brother that you have made to sin, he has slept with you because he looked at you with the lustful intent. Now he has gone to sleep and he's not waking up. So he's dead. He's dead and buried. He's gone. As he is gone, he's going to hell. So you are going to follow him to hell because that's your destination. As he has gone there, so is also to you. So you need to be very careful. Don't just come and condemn somebody you are going to hell. Then you come back to John chapter 3, verse 16 again. For God so loved the world. If you want, you can go to John chapter 19, verse 30, the Bill of Rights. It is finished. That is where the price was paid. But he came and this is where the price was paid. You follow this man. You can read First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15. We are passing through the earth. We are not here to stay. So I'll open up for questions. Questions. I don't know. I don't know who's, who's trying to ask a person. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, I have a question here uh, concerning evangelism. Um, what are the things we should expect when doing evangelism? What are the things that um, yes. there are many faults? One, expect rejection. Expect that somebody is going to mock you. Let me, let, let me give you two Bible verses. Then I'll answer your question in a greater detail. One, let's read First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. When they come and ask the question, you are supposed to answer according to that type of verse. Can you read it for us, please? Okay. First Peter chapter 3, verse... Verse 15. Okay. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, I read. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen. The Bible is very clear. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every question that man asked you the reason of the hope. The reason of the hope because you are evangelizing. Why are you evangelizing? Because you want people to go to heaven. This is the hope that we have. At one day, we are going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to go now to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. When you preach the gospel, you are obligated to answer questions. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. But yeah. avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. I want, I want to read from, I want you to see the difference. The spirit of God flows in the King James. Yes, we have got a deeper understanding, but, still, but foolish and unlearned persons avoid knowing that they do gender strife, they generate strife, they cause quarrel. They will come and tell you who is the mother of God. 
Where did God come from? Those are stupid questions. Those are stupid questions. You cannot come through and say, who is the father of God? If you know, okay, if you know that this is the father of God, what are you going to do about it? You are working in a company. I don't need to know, I don't need not to know the director of the company. I just know my immediate boss. That's the, all, that's the only thing that you know. So those are foolish questions that generate strife. So as you want, as you are evangelizing now, they will come in one. You are coming, you are challenging the status quo. The same resistance which the Lord Jesus Christ faced when he came to the Pharisees. Let us go to Matthew chapter 23. I will show you something. It was quite interesting. I saw it also in the book of Luke. When I was reading the book of Luke a few days ago, I was just doing a, a Bible study on the book of Luke. He said in the book of Luke, uh, Matthew chapter 23, sorry, we can get it from 23. Yeah. It says this one. Uh, let me check. I, I, I want to check when this, the, um, I think from 27, a bit 27, once I'm looking at the particular verse, the one that I wanted. Matthew 23, 27. What to mm. you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Just a minute, let me quickly check. Where, where, where they were asking, says, ah, what about us? It was described, once I was doing it in the, look, in the book of Luke, where he asked the, the scribes, they came, says, ah, what about us? They were asking, they will come Pentecostal. Catholic, they will come. They said, sir, what about us? So oh, who aren't you scribes? You, you went to scribes, you went to this ones. They say, sir, what about us? They came in and said, what about us in holiness? They said, who aren't you? He came, he was every other person was not standing right. He came because they thought they were only a better standing. They know the scriptures. So he said, who aren't you? So one resistance by the people, especially in faith. People who think that they have known the Bible when they don't. They have been deceived and they are deceiving others as a result of ignorance. So one, resistance. Second, personal attacks. If they know said, ah, can, can, can you tell me your profession, please? Expect those things. When you go to First, uh, first Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, 23, it says you are not saved because you believed. Sorry, we are saved because we believe. We are not saved because we went to school. We are not saved because we are not, we are not going to work. We are not saved because we are not working. We are saved because we believe. That is the qualification of a believer. So expect people, one, they want to take you on a personal, on a, on a personal basis. They want to make you say, ah, can you just tell me your level of education, please? Because if they must get somewhere where they can pinch you, said, ah, you know, I'm a professor, I've got um, three PhDs. Forget about that nonsense. There is no PhD. I talked to one man, he said, I've got three masters for the Bible. He said, how many masters will Apostle Paul have got now? He will have got 100 now. If you are getting masters from the book of Ephesians, what about Apostle Paul who wrote all the books? So one, it expect personal attacks. Two, these people are ultra defensive. These are replacement theologists. People who come and replace and say, no, they know what God wanted to say. Where you should read them, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Scripture is not for private interpretation. It's your opinion is not needed. Even those useless books at times they write saying it was inspired, it looks academic in nature, but without spirit. The spirit of God does not flow in them. They are just making money using God. They said, if I go and sin, they are going to arrest me. Read your Bible, read your Bible. Every other thing comes from the Bible. So personal attacks, very important. Always check personal attacks. The second thing, resistance. So you, so, so you are trying to say, if I'm dressed like this, God does not 
um, is not going to rapture me. No, it's not God you say, it's the Bible. Nothing unholy is going to get into his presence. When you read uh, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12, where they are ashamed of their lawful conduct, say no. These are people who are living in sin and also encourage others to live in sin. The same thing I think was repeated in Romans chapter 1, verse 32. They are not only living in sin, they are encouraging others to live in sin. So these are the people say, don't mind them. You see, this woman, she 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 thinks like she she thinks like she she knows the Bible too well. Huh? The one I don't feel born yourself. Huh? How old are you anyway? You see, I'm I'm 34. Uh -uh. Yeah, even two years older than my first concert. You see, what can you tell me? How long have you been in ministry? I've been in ministry for, for, for 35 years. It's not the amount of years that I spent in ministry. Forget about the years. It's like spending, I have been, say yes, but you don't understand the concept for holiness. Say yes. What do you understand by holiness? Sanctification, consecration. If these words are not part of your vocabulary, then you are a baby Christian. You need to sit down and be taught the scriptures. You can come with the vain words where people are trying, they've mastered the skill of deceit. The devil is so wise, he's using this unregenerated source. From outside, they look like, it's the same way the Pharisees were. That's why the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, what, if, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, or oh yes, you are not going to see the kingdom of God. The Bible is very clear. Don't apologize when you're preaching. No apologies. If you're offended, I'm sorry, but that's how it is. I would rather offend you here because I am freeing my soul. I don't want your blood on my hands. Either you reject, but like I always say, when I come to evangelize, I'm not asking you to come and receive the word. If you are convicted, you receive. If not, I'm just making it possible for the Lord to come and pain you. If, you. if you die, you are going straight to hell. I have no power to convict you. But if you don't say, God, I just want to follow you, it's okay. I have placed a seed. That's what that's as far as I can go. Because when you're coming in, I'm not you are not coming into my kingdom. It's God. No man commit unto me unless he's done by my spirit. But how do we make the spirit active? We have got to breathe into the soul. How do we breathe by giving the word of God? But the Jimmy, wake up. Praise the Lord. So um so there's a head, Sister Noella. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you again, Sister Noel. I've got all your time. I'm, I'm ready for any question. Sister Noella, you're muted. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. I just wish to find out uh, with regards to evangelism because I, I usually do market evangelism, so I don't know. I don't, it's a bit usually difficult to follow up because when I go, you just, I just, I have a speaker and a microphone and I evangelize at the end so people can give me their numbers. So my, my, my problem is how can I really, it's, uh, it's really difficult to say I will be following up because people that I know, I meet them. I don't really get to follow them up. Like how to follow up some souls that you meet during or you go out for evangelism like this. Okay, praise the Lord. That's a very good question. We have got our WhatsApp groups like who will be decentralizing. We've got Uganda, we've got Kenya, we've got Tanzania, we've got South Africa, we've got almost every country. So what we'll do, I, I will come back to you and add you into the group so, so that we can add them into the group. We'll be sending, getting messages. If there's anything, any way that they'll be getting them in. That's another way of keeping them informed. If they are to, like messages, the messages that we preach, we give them uh, MP3 audios. That is very important. Because the people in Africa, ah, French speaking. Okay. Okay. If they were German, I would develop them. But uh, all the same, do you speak French, my sister? I know you speak only Spanish and English. Do you speak also French? 
Yeah, when I go out, I evangelize in French. Go where I am, it's a French zone, so we don't really understand English much. So I speak in French. No, then, so then it's okay. Uh, you just disciple them from that group. If um, unless if they want any special session like we do with India, Pakistan, then we can have one time where we can be teaching them the most important things like baptism so that they understand. We can do it in English, somebody translating. We can do it through WhatsApp that they can understand. So we can do some kind of teachings where somebody speak in English, they translate in, um, in French, and then we can have their questions. Yes, that's what we're doing in Burundi and Kenya as well, in Tanzania. Okay, I think that would be helpful because they always ask where is your church, want to join your church. I say, even though I, when I go, I don't talk about church. I'm leading, I'm leading them to it is okay because we are bringing people into the kingdom of God. That must not be misunderstood. When we are coming, we are not saying, come to church, if you are not in church, you are not going to heaven. We are not a cult. We are not a cult. That must be understood. Except the Bible, we have nothing to offer except the kingdom of God. If you choose to come in fellowship with us, it's okay. Then we will welcome you, we will give you into our groups. We have got our um, leadership here, very active indeed. I can see their smells all over, they're ready to go. So they will come and receive you and guide in any possible way. We will soon be traveling to Africa by the grace of God if the COVID is if there's a alternative to medication for COVID, the vaccinations. We are praying that by mid-year, June, July, August, it should have been resolved through medical means. Evangelist Lillian, even though I'm not seeing you, I'm feeling another question again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So what are the most effective ways of doing evangelism? What are the most effective ways? The most effective ways of doing evangelism, one, don't, don't condemn people. You are not coming here bringing glad tidings. Blessed are the feet that brings the glad tidings. So when you come in and condemn people, they will push you back. They become negative. They don't want to hear a gospel because you have come to condemn them. They are sinners. So what are you coming to do if you have come to sin to, to, to condemn us? So one, when you reach out to people, the most important thing is, ah, brethren, I have come. I know I do not come as somebody who is holy. I believe every word that is written in the Bible, even though I don't understand everything. So if there are questions that both of us may not be able to understand, we will leave them to the Holy Spirit. When I come back, or I can ask my fellow workers in the vineyard, who have been longer or who have been gifted in the word to come and explain. So don't condemn people, bring them to the Lord. Tell them more about the love of God. He is crying. Tell somebody how many, of, how many members of your family have been saved. There are some people, remember when the Lord Jesus Christ met the disciples, Luke chapter five or six, they were washing their nets. What does it mean washing their nets? At least they do good even though they're not Christians. Some, you are a sinner, you steal, you lie, you do this, all those sins. Somebody's blind, somebody's crippled, he's walking, he is on a wheelchair. They are still smoking and drinking. It doesn't make much, much of a difference. In that, that crippled state, you will still bend. Because he did not say when you are crippled, it's an exemption. No. So you must encourage them to live a holy life. When you come to Christ, tell them your challenges comes in because now we are going to the opposite direction with the devil. All truth must be told to somebody. That's why the, the Lord said, Peter, do you love me? Three times he said, feed my sheep. There's always a danger when people come to Christ. The devil multiplies attacks. They lose their confidence. They stumble. They lose the confidence. They start doubting the word of God. 
Because faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. That's why it's important to disciple. Unless we are ready for fallout, don't go and disciple. You, dis you talk to people today, tomorrow after six months, they come and say, that way, which way? They've long forgotten about it. They've gone back to their ways because there was nobody to disciple them, nobody to strengthen them. Now they're feeling more comfortable. They think you wanted to take them on the wrong path. That's why they're feeling comfortable now. So when you approach people, approach them in a way that one, they do not feel condemned. Identify, I, am, I was one of you, I was saved. I have come to the light. We are a royal priesthood. We are called to save. Then you go, ask them, are you a Christian, my brother? Are you a Christian, my sister? Or oh, are you in faith? Maybe they say, I'm Buddha, I'm Bawai, I'm this. Then you ask them, they said, yes, sir. I mean, I'm this, I'm that, said, okay. Uh, do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming? Say, no, I don't. There are people who don't believe in his catology, the return of Christ. They don't believe in those things. These are things that affect even people with the prophetic gift because they've got this personal preference. When the Lord speaks, they tend to interpret with their understanding. Even if God speaks, they still want to, to put a narrative of what God is trying to say, which I think is wrong. So when you're going out to people, try to understand, don't miss the words, don't make it sugar-coated. Make it as clear, as blunt as it can be, to say there is hope in Christ. There is hope. Out there, there's nothing there in the world. And use your personal experience also to say, I am coming from the world. Because all of us, we are coming from the world. Some of us, we were good sinners, great sinners. Once you tell somebody, say, oh, this one you are doing, say, is God going to accept it? Sit down. Let me tell you what I did. So, uh, so if God can use it, means he can use me, say, oh, yes. So your, your testimony comes from, it gives you authority to minister. I just had to say, uh, I just had, no, no own testimony. This is how the Lord directed me. This is how he started dealing with me. I used to be very rebellious. I used to fight people around me. I used to fight in my family. I used to do this, I used to do that. And that record is being confirmed by everyone. So, ah, this person changed. Let your speech be with grace and seasoned with salt. There are people like who went to the school of wrong talking. They just answer, ah, oh, that son of a something. Uh -uh. They speak American English, kissing, kissing everybody. So those things are wrong for a Christian. You are still testing, there is something wrong with your Christianity. You could have been falsely converted. That I can I can see you smiling. Please. That I Yes. Person. No. Okay. Brother Kasana David. Or a pastor, I'm not sure, minister. You can speak, sir, if you have got a question. The only, the only other thing is stop apologizing for being Christians. Stop apologizing. If anybody who is in homosexuality come and say, ah, is God going to accept me? He said, yes, but you must repent. And you are not going back to your vomit again. Because if you come to this knowledge of truth and then go on willfully sinning, there's no more sacrifice left for you. If you die in that state, what else are you hoping for? Because tomorrow is not promised. Don't promise people tomorrow. Yeah, please. I think, I think uh, uh, brother, he said to, Wilson has a question, I think. Okay. Please. Uh, hello? Yes, please, quiet. Uh, my question was, um, what is the Bible's view on uh, 
wedding rings. Can you still be married without a wedding ring? Um, this is, these are outward adornments. The actual rings, this is a culture which was started by the Europeans, the Western world. The actual, the actual, um, because they, they promote outward um, adornment. It brings up to the biblical standard. I can check. I, I don't know where my, <laughs> where I wrote all those things are now, but I think one of the ministers have got the things around. Uh, they, 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 they should be ready uh, somewhere, somewhere here. Then we can go into the scriptures. I think we've got four or five scriptures where we can break it up. One, when we are getting married or when people are getting married, it's a spiritual. Remember, the Bible talks about marriage. It starts with marriage, marriage, divorce, marriage. When it starts from Genesis, where God was now coming back again to humanity, but it's not a subject for this. this the, the, I'm, I'm just talking about the marriage, marriage. Why God say, I hate divorce? Everything about marriage pertains to God getting back his people. So when you say Mary, it's a spiritual exercise. This body that we talk about is this, um, I don't know how we, we call it, uh, uh, like child's play. It's not real. In the spiritual, in the spiritual world is where things happen. So when you take a Bible and you join people spiritually, are joined and joined forever. That brings us to Malachi chapter 2, 14, I think, where it says marriage is a covenant. It's not a contract. Now it's easy to take that piece of paper, toy it, uh, get out of my house. That's what they were saying. That's why they came, they came to the Lord say, hey, uh, I will give my wife a divorce certificate. He said, no, if you do it, we see the perversion. So the issue of rings, I don't put on a ring, but it doesn't make me less of a man or people don't, that doesn't think I'm not married. If anybody has got ideas and said, ah, I'm sorry, you came in a little bit late. You left to wait for the right candidate. Oh, okay, Evangelist Lene said they got it from, from Joseph, from Pharaoh, from Joseph. These are the, the, the Pharaoh is just like a, it, it was a demonic king, demonic incarnate kingdom of the devil on the earth. Very hard at it. That's why God wanted Pharaoh to do his thing. So the issue of rings, I'm not sure, but I just, I don't know. I cannot answer it quite um, with the relevant scriptures. I, I will need to check. You can check briefly whilst I'm checking for. Praise the Lord. Uh, thank you, man of God. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let's Just a small uh, um, uh, When we look at the scripture in the Bible, there is nowhere where we, like, uh, where the Bible, you know, uh, tells us, like, about marriage and ring, wedding rings. Because when God was, uh, God created Adam, the Bible says he created Eva and he brought Eva to a woman to Adam, and then Adam says, you are a, a flesh of my flesh, a bone of my bone. You will be called a woman. So there is nothing like, oh, God, you know, had to wed them or what. We, we don't see anything like Abraham and Sarah wearing, like they had a wedding ring. Mostly this wedding ring, it's a, it's a you know, like a pagan, pagan uh, a ritual or culture whereby most it was adopted from... Uh, According to Genesis 41, 42, when we see Pharaoh, then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and, the, and he clothed him in a, in a garment of fine, fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. So we see here Pharaoh and Joseph, there was, they were both men. So this is like, they were, they were not, Joseph was not a gay, but he gave him this ring as a, as a, like a sign of honor 
you know, to honor him or to, you know, to, to separate him from other, you know, from his other fellow workers, whatever. But it doesn't give us a right to put on wedding ring. When you look at wedding ring, it's on the, is it on the third, the third or fourth finger? It has nothing to connect to or to, to bring love or to, to, to keep that love bond. Praise the Lord. Because we see today so many uh, uh, Christians, even pastors, or they, they are cheating on their, in their spouses with rings on. We see many people, marriages are breaking, breaking and divided, and we see so many divorce, yet people have rings. So to me, uh, the ring that brings this marriage or keeps it strong is the heart. If you love your spouse, then you, there is no reason like, oh, you know, you have to cheat on her or you have to go outside with another woman or another man because you love, it is love. The whole thing is love. And our, our ring should be the love and they, they should be love, strong love, your heart and the word of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, the, the golden rings, okay, no, that's what I was trying, I'm trying to look at something. I, I will explain uh, briefly the spiritual gifts. That is very important to understand, the spiritual gifts. Um, one, spiritual gifts, let me look about the first one. Golden Can come earring. In Sorry? Can I come in okay. a little bit? Okay, just let me explain this. Just give me a minute. Let me explain this, then you come in. One, the gift, the earrings, the, the earrings on the ears, spiritually, they represent knowledge. Then another gift, um, another gift is the golden heart, the golden heart, if it is put on somebody's heart, it's understanding. The bracelet, it's discretion, the one that you put in there. A golden nose, it's ornament. Golden rings is the ability to communicate. But they were not meant for that. A gold necklace is for the fear of the Lord. So when you look at these gifts now, this is where the pack, this is where the devil always try to imitate everything that God does ability to communicate. This is, where they, this is where he told the people in the garden, he said, forget about it, God is a liar. God, he knows if you eat of this fruit, that's how you become. So he thought, because when, when we put ring as a sign of um, confidence, it's only God we can put that because it's eternal. We can only give uh, what our... Um, by our weight, I think we can, the same way when you promise something, when you swore, it's like you are swearing, I'll be with this woman, I'll be with that man until the end of my days. If you break it, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, then you wish you never promised because your punishment will be better. That Helen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, I... I think we should not dress up uh, uh, rings because uh, the word of God us are talking about uh, jewelries. And also uh, that you, we should not use jewelries. And don't, yeah. Uh, uh, I read, I don't, I don't remember where in the, in the Bible. So they were no. talking about, about the gold and the silvers that is, it is not good for us to, to use it. And those rings that are one of, of these things, I think that's why. Amen. Ah, okay. That, that is in uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 1 to 5. Jacob commanded them to put away dwellers in which he called strange gods. That made Genesis them strange what? gods. Sorry. Genesis, Genesis chapter, 30, chapter 35, 35, verse 1 to 5. They were putting on those ornaments, and he said this as he called them strange gods. Pastor, can, can you can you can you read that for us, please, for the question that you asked? Genesis chapter thirty-five. If you give me your number, I will send you the scriptures which I did before. Genesis chapter thirty-five, verse one to five. When you read also 
Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25 to 26. The silver on gold on heaven are not to be desired by the children of God, nor brought into their homes. So we can see here, Judges, judge, the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 24. Only heavens and believers continue to wear ear earrings, which Gideon took all the, they and their animals ornaments to make an effort. But the children of God started warring after it. They started wanting to go after it. So in Exodus chapter 32, when they made the, that elephant, that calf, God just gave them plagues. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30. God said it is vain to wear costly attire, wear ornaments, and paint the face. So we can see it talks more about jewelry, jewelry, jewelry. God promised to punish for burning incense and decorating yourself to earrings and jewelry, jewels and prostituting yourself, thus forgetting God. Remember, in the Bible, we are the bride of Christ. So we, you and I, we are, we are both bride of Christ. So I, I will send you these Bible verses so that you can check them through. I have found where they are. If in perfume, everything that people will use, it is there. I did not see the message. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, Pastor. I, I, I think um, I'll do a bit of research so that we come and talk only about the issue of wedding rings. It's important that I come with all the scriptures. You, you can get my number. I'll send you a message. Then I'll send you the scriptures that I have. In the meantime, when I come, then we'll bring something extensive. Ah, uh, okay. We'll Thank put... you, Manu. Thank you. Okay. When you want other scriptures, other materials, we'll give them to you as well. Because it's, it's very important. I think I was talking to some ministers that you must don't be, don't talk about things that you have no understanding of. Like here, I said, no, I would rather have a bit of research, get my scriptures right, instead of coming, say, ah, every scripture, yes, I know this is right, I know it's like this. It becomes a lie. We need that standard. We need that honesty in ministry. It is what is lacking today. When you say, I don't quite understand this thing, go and research, it's okay. Ask my peers. When I come, I'm much more ready. I will give you half begged. That can easily mislead you. So we need that honesty in Christianity. Like I say, First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, allows us or obligates us to answer questions. And if we don't understand, let us give us opportunity to come back, to come back and bring the answers. Instead of thinking, uh, no, I have got every question. If you see me claiming I have got every question, every answer to every question, then it's a lie. It's a lie. I know quite a lot, but not everything that I know. There are other areas that I'm not comfortable discussing, like where I can give you 10, 15 Bible verses, I'm comfortable. But I do not want to poison somebody. But the Chimmy, I know we've taken too much of your time. <laughs> it is well. So we'll come again with a program on the issue of the wedding rings. I don't know what time, what is the most convenient time? Which country are you, Pastor Kesutu? Does anybody know which country he's, he's from? A, he's in a DS, DRC, Congo. Ah, okay. DRC, that means it must be 12 now, getting to midnight, right? Yes, yes, yes it's coming to midnight, but, but it's okay. Okay. And no, it's okay. We, 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 can make it, we, can, we can make it like four UK time. Then Pastor it allows David everybody. In Burundi. Ah, Pastor David in Burundi. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll make it like for UK time that it allows also everybody to have like time time. Mm -hmm. 
it inconveniences us a bit early, but we also want them to be part and parcel of the and uh, Sister Roy is in Uganda. Sister Nema is in Uganda. Mm. Sister Nema is the, the mobilisia. Evangelist. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sister Royce, I think I know her. I've got a number. So the if we vote questions, I think we can put them to we can sub and add them, sorry. One more question. Yeah, please. So we talked. You talked about uh, uh, modest and decent dressing, Christian mm -hmm. women, and uh, is also men have a uh, uh, you know like a Christian dressing, men Christian dressing. Do they also dress in modesty? Does it only work on women? And what is there any dress code for modesty? Thank you. The Bible is, does not discriminate or respect men. God is not a respecter of men. If I put on clothes that can make a woman fall, I put on coming in with chest like this and say, look, I've got a six pack. It's just as immoral as a woman is putting on a minister. It's meant for sexual purposes. There is no other purpose that you want. You are not doing it for fitness. If it is for fitness to dress with the way that I'm dressing. So if you do it, say, oh, this man is strong. Oh, this man is like this. So when it comes to this, why the Bible say, when the Bible says brother, it does not mean brother. It can mean your wife. It can mean your mother. So it's, it just goes, just interchange where it's written women. Yes, we say women because it makes women to fall more and it causes men to fall. Women fall, the women make men fall more than it will cost a man to. If I come in, it takes not very few men can, very few women can be turned on with a man who's like this. Some are actually put off. Some are actually put off. So dressing, it applies to everybody, everybody. Not only the women. It is like when you talk about submission, you, if you want your wife to submit in all areas, that's the same thing that you must do to God, submit in every area. Otherwise, we become hypocrites. You cannot come and say, ah, oh, the Bible says wives, you must do this. You are also a wife of Christ. Are you, are you fully submissive? Remember by the same measure that you judge, so shall you be judged. So you cannot come and say, ah, oh, yeah, wife, you must be able, you must be, you must be able to, uh, you must submit. Yes, that's what the Bible says. It's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. Unless if somebody that's generally hot headed or hard hearted, that's a different case. But if it is a genuinely true child of God, then you must be able to take correction, to be broken, to be able to walk in the power of God. It's Holy Spirit that humbles you. When you see yourself not humbling yourself, even at work, it's a false humility. Can I comment a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. You praise the Lord. Yeah, there is a, a, a this men, uh, they dress up this short trousers and this singlets, but when you tell them, they said, no, it is a, a dress of a man, it is a sin. This is a sin, even the dress of man. It's the same as women with dressing up with these men's isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. The dress code for when God judges is not a respecter of men. He is not a respecter of men. When God is coming, he is not coming to say, ah, I am the man. So, you know, when I, when I come in, that man putting on that short, that short trousers, this man, it's immoral. You're just like a woman putting on a ministry. Hmm. You and that woman is just the same. Oh, yes. People can defend it for all they care. But we are not going to apologize for that. 
it is immoral. Unless you are in your bedroom, you want to sleep with your bed, the suit, no problem. Sister Reyes came from Bazi. And I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And I came in. I'm handing over to you. We give God all the praises. We thank God for his mercy, for the time he has given us. Let's just begin to glorify God. Let's begin to give God.